Okay. Good morning, everyone. Hope you're all doing well. My name's Nick Barberis. I'm a professor of finance at the School of Management here at Yale, and I'd like to welcome you all back to campus. I hope you're having a good time uh, so far. Uh, so, as you know, the university is a, a leading force in many areas of research, and so it is also for the School of Management that it's a leading school uh, in many areas of research. And I wanted to talk to you today about just one area of research within management that Yale SOM is particularly well known for, which is behavioral finance. It's a large and active area of financial economics that Yale is on, by many people, thought to have sort of the leading research group. Uh, in the country. And I wanted to apply this in particular to talking about the recent financial crisis, the financial crisis we're still going through. And you'll see in a second what that means is we're really going to be talking about the psychology of the financial crisis. So I'm going to talk, not for very long, uh, I promise, and then leave lots of times for any questions or discussion points you may have. Uh, I would appreciate it if you might keep your questions until the end, because uh, we're actually being filmed today, so it might be easier to keep the questions until the end. I suspect that some of you have a lot of background in finance, financial markets, and so on, uh, but I am going to try and keep this talk quite simple so that it's intelligible even to people that don't have any background in finance or in financial markets, but I hope that nonetheless uh, there'll be something here of interest for everyone. Uh, and the last thing I'd ask is if you could sort of uh, put your cell phones on vibrate or on silent at least for the next hour, uh, again because of the filming. So just a little bit of background first about uh, behavioral finance. What's all this about? Um, so I think a lot of you know that when economists try to explain how financial markets work, they always assume that everyone out there is rational. And what does that mean? Rationality means a couple of things. First of all, it means that when you get new information, you update your beliefs correctly. And secondly, it means that given your beliefs, you make sensible decisions. And it would be wonderful if that explained the world, because it's a very simple and parsimonious way of looking at things. But it's become pretty clear that lots of things, like the tech stock bubble in the late 1990s, the recent housing bubble, just don't fit that framework very well. Well, luckily, there's an alternative. It's been around for decades, and it's called behavioral finance. And it argues that lots of financial phenomena out there might be the result of less than fully rational decision making on the part of some people. And it advocates reading the psychology literature closely to try and understand the ways in which people are less than fully rational, particularly the work of Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize for this work a few years ago, and for Amos Tversky, his colleague who would have won the Nobel Prize, also unfortunately passed away a few years ago. And it's been applied to understanding the pricing of financial assets, how ordinary people like us invest and trade over time, and aspects of corporate finance as well. So I hope you see that there's really two schools of thought uh, in academia, but also in the practitioner world about how financial markets work. There's kind of the rational agents camp. So these people believe that everything is the result of rational decision making. And then there's the behavioral finance camp, which argues that some stuff out there might be the result of less than fully rational decision making. And some of the best known people uh, leading the discussion on each side are these. So on the rational agent side, my former colleague, I used to teach at the University of Chicago, my former colleague, Gene Farmer. And on the behavioral finance side, my current colleague here at Yale, Bob Schiller, that I suspect many of you have heard of through his books, uh, Irrational Exuberance, and more recently, Animal Spirits. And his presence here at Yale is a significant reason why Yale is considered a leading research group in this area. Uh, but it's not just him. There's actually a large group of us that work on this kind of research. And I have to say that both of these people are very likely to win Nobel Prizes at some point, but uh, you know, obviously not in the same year, because they say largely <laughs> contradictory things. So what I wanted to do today was just sort of apply behavioral finance a little bit to the, the financial crisis we've been, been going through, we're still going through. So what this is going to be is the role of less than fully rational thinking uh, in the crisis. Um, in other words, psychological factors that might have created and enhanced the crisis. That's really what the, the discussion is going to be. So let's do just sort of a one-minute overview of this crisis. How can we describe it in simple terms? Um, so you might think that there are some loan originators, sort of local lenders, who make loans to local borrowers, for example, even subprime borrowers. 
And then those loans are sold to investment banks, which package them into securities like mortgage-backed securities, CDOs, and so on. And those are rated by certain ratings agencies and then sold to end investors. And I guess sort of the, the 30 second summary of the financial crisis is just that these subprime borrowers defaulted. So the value of these securities associated with these loans held by the investment banks on their asset side of the balance sheet went down a lot in value. The banks became very nervous, they stopped lending, and the economy slowed. And if you read the financial press, there's really two narratives that they give about what happened here. And you can think a little bit about which narrative you believe. The first narrative is what I might call the bad incentives view. So here that the story is banks knew all along that these loans had a significant chance of default and there could be trouble, but they just didn't care because their incentives led them to keep originating and packaging these loans. Their incentives were based on the quantity of the deals they were doing, not on the quality of the deals, not on, not on the quality. So I suspect that there is some truth to this. A lot of people believe there is some truth to this, that the incentives were bad, but I don't think it's a complete explanation because senior figures at many of these banks did suffer large financial losses during the crisis. So would they really have pursued the strategy that they did if they were aware of the risks? Wouldn't they have preferred to instead scale back their activities a bit? And some banks like Goldman Sachs, for example, did exactly that. So I don't think it's a complete explanation. Then there's a second view, a second narrative, what I'll call the bad models view, the bad models narrative. This says there was nothing wrong with banks' incentives. They simply failed to forecast the severity, the likelihood of a collapse. The models they were using to forecast the future just failed to take into account the possibility, for example, of a national downturn in housing prices, failed to take into account extreme events, which we often call fat tails. And I think this is definitely true to some extent. The models these banks were using were just not adequate, but it doesn't strike me as a complete explanation or something's missing here. How could so many smart, well-trained people working at these banks be comfortable with such deficient models? It doesn't quite add up. It doesn't quite make sense. So I don't think either of these stories fully captures what's going on. Uh, so I want to suggest to you something else today, again, uh, which has its roots in behavioral finance. So the story I want to suggest today is something a little bit different. I want to suggest that on some level, banks were aware that there were problems with the business model they were pursuing, but as a result of a number of psychological factors, they essentially deluded themselves into thinking that everything was okay, and they just kept going. So I'm going to kind of push that narrative a little bit today. And I'm also, in the second part of the talk, going to talk a little bit about some psychological factors that may be relevant to a couple of the other intriguing aspects of this crisis. The fact that trading has completely dried up in certain markets, which is very puzzling. The belief that a lot of people had that house prices would just keep on rising. Where did that belief come from? And the willingness of many households to take out excessively large loans. What might have propelled that? So really what I'm going to do is just pick out a number of important ideas from cognitive and social psychology and argue that they may have played a role. And, and really it's too early for me to really present rigorous research. I'm really just suggesting some ideas that we might pursue in the next few months. And then at the end you can tell me which ones you find more or less plausible. All right, so first idea, perhaps the most famous idea in social psychology, cognitive dissonance. So as many of you will remember, cognitive dissonance is the discomfort we feel when we take an action that conflicts with our typically positive self-image. And to remove this sense of discomfort, what we often do is we manipulate our beliefs. So a simple example is smoking. Suppose you're a smoker. Uh, what you say to yourself is, look, you know, I'm a sensible person, but here I am smoking, which is bad for my long-run health. So that induces dissonance. Why am I, a sensible person, doing something that's bad for my long-run health? So that induces a sense of discomfort, dissonance. So what do you do? Well, you could just quit smoking, but that's difficult. So instead, you manipulate your beliefs. You tell yourself that smoking really isn't that risky. Or you think of that 90-year-old person down the road who's been smoking all of his life and is perfectly fine. You tell yourself stories like that. 
So you can very simply apply this to recent activity at the banks. You can just say, look, the people working at the banks typically had a very positive self-image. They were typically very smart, great education, great interpersonal skills, often Yale graduates. They really felt they were wonderful, <laughs> w w wonderful people. Um, so any sign that, that what they were doing was not sensible would quickly induce dissonance, right? Why, how can I, a wonderfully sensible and talented person, be engaged in a business model that doesn't make any sense? So that induces dissonance. What do you do? You manipulate your beliefs. You tell yourself that, you know what, this business model isn't so messed up, or you ignore warning signs and keep on pursuing the path you are pursuing, sort of ignoring indications that what you're doing doesn't make any sense because you want to avoid dissonance. Another very famous idea from social psychology, conformity. We have a very strong tendency to conform to what the group we belong to is doing, even if we don't think it makes sense. And we think that this stems from a very basic human need to be liked and accepted by others. And the classic demonstration of this that many of you may remember are the ash line experiments from the 1950, which I can describe quite simply. Uh, what you have is an experimenter over here on the right and a group of subjects. And what the experimenter does is ask each of the sub subjects in turn to state publicly the answer to the following question. Which of these three lines on the right here is closest in length to this original line? Simple question. So what happens is all the subjects except one are accomplices of the experimenter. And in, one <laughs> and in one particular trial, they all deliberately give the wrong answer. And then the interesting question is, what does the final person who's not an accomplice, what does that person say? Uh, does he give the correct answer? Or because of a desire to conform, does he publicly give the erroneous answer. So in this example, you can see clearly the right answer is line C, but in one trial, six out of these seven subjects deliberately said A. And then the question was, what would the seventh person say? And the remarkable finding is that more than 50% of the time, the seventh subject will say A. Quite, even though it's clearly the wrong answer, we'll just say A. Uh, because he or she really wants to conform. And it's, you probably can't see it very well, but it's actually very funny to, to see a close-up here. Uh, these are the accomplices, and this is the poor subject who's not, uh, <laughs> not in on the game. And the expression on his face is just priceless. I mean, he's deeply confused. Uh, he's staring, staring at these lines on the board, and... Uh, not knowing what's going on, but because of the need to conform, says A. So you can see the application of this as well to the recent crisis. Uh, you might be working in a bank and you see signs of trouble, but because of the need, the desire to conform, you just don't say anything. You just don't cause a fuss. You say to yourself, look, no one else working here is saying anything, so I'm not going to say anything either because I want to conform. And the studies have shown that this is particularly strong uh, when the group you belong to exhibits what's called stre strength or immediacy. Uh, strength is the importance of the group to you, and immediacy is the proximity of the group. And I think both of these are quite acute. If you're working in one of these banks, you really enjoy working there, so the group is important to you. And of course, the people in the group are right around you on the trading floor, for example. So we think that conformity is, the desire for it is quite strong in these situations. Now, an extension of the conformity idea is another idea I suspect that some of you are familiar with, which is groupthink. And this is an idea that was developed here at Yale in the 1970s by, or earlier, sorry, in the 1950s by Irving Janis. And it's a kind of thinking in which group cohesiveness is more important than carefully considering the facts. And it's thought to be particularly strong when, and here are sort of some of the symptoms, when the group is valued and attractive to belong to, when the group is isolated from other opinions, when there's a strong leader who makes his view known, when the situation's stressful, and there's no process for considering other viewpoints. Those are some of the, the, sort of the factors that lead to groupthink, and some of the symptoms of it are that people decide not to voice contrary opinions so as not to rock the boat. There's pressure on dissenters to conform, and opposing opinions are stereotyped in a simplistic way. And many of you may know that the original 
groupthink studies were sort of aimed at understanding the Bay of Pigs disaster, why was the group of people charged with making the decision about that expedition, why did they get it so wrong? And Janice suspected groupthink. But it's been applied in many other situations, the invasion of Korea in 1950, escalation of the Vietnam War in the 1960s, and more recently, as you all know, to the CIA assessment of the state of Iraqi weaponry. Well, you can see again the application to the current crisis. What strikes me is that many of the contributing factors to groupthink uh, are indeed met. If you look at some of these, the group is valued and attractive to belong to. If you're on the board of directors, say, of one of these large banks, that's a really nice group to belong to. And you really want to keep belonging to that group. And that can contribute to groupthink. The group is isolated from other opinions. If you look at the backgrounds of the people who are on these boards of directors, they're not as diverse as you would like them to be. There's not enough divergence, uh, enough sort of differing viewpoints contributed. There's a strong leader who makes his views known. That was certainly true in some cases. If you think of Stan O'Neill at Merrill Lynch, he was very clear that he wanted the bank to expand into risky mortgage-related areas. And therefore, the group just follows suit, just follows his thinking. So it strikes us that there are many of the preconditions for groupthink are indeed met. Okay, another very famous idea from social psychology, again, an idea developed here at Yale, uh, which I think many of you may know, is the obedience idea, the famous Milgram experiments from the 1960s. And the basic conclusion there was people are remarkably willing to follow instructions from an authority figure even when the task seems completely inappropriate. So I suspect that many of you had to learn about these studies as a famous Yale uh, research contribution during your undergraduate years. But let me briefly repeat what, what happened. Uh, as you know, we can't really do experiments of this kind anymore. Um, so uh, there's an experimenter, and there's two subjects, a teacher and a student. And what happens is the teacher is supposed to teach a few things to the student and then test the student on these things. And if the student gets something wrong, uh, the teacher is supposed to give the student what he believes to be an electric shock. Okay? Um, this is why we can't do these experiments anymore, obviously. <laughs> Uh, so the important thing to understand here is that the electric shocks are not real. The teacher believes them to be real, but the student, who is an accomplice of the experimenter, is, does not actually feel anything, but pretends that they are real. So there's a lot of acting and shrieking and shouting going on to make it appear that the shocks are real. So the way this proceeds is, you know, the teacher teaches a few things to the student and then tests the student, asks him a question, and the student will deliberately get something wrong, and then the experimenter says, okay, please deliver the first shock, and the question is whether the teacher does so. Uh, if he does so, then we continue, and the student gets another question wrong, and the experimenter says, okay, please now deliver a stronger electric shock, and the question is whether the teacher does so, and then we keep going. Uh, in many cases, obviously, the teacher feels uncomfortable and sort of unsure what to do uh, and looks to the experimenter and the experimenter says things like it, it is important that you continue or please continue as we discussed earlier and it turns out that just simple nudges like that are enough to lead 60% of the teachers to deliver what they believe to be even the strongest electric shock of 450 volts. So those are the slightly disturbing conclusions from these very well-known studies by Milgram here at Yale in the 1960s. So what's going on? There's a huge amount of research about what's going on in these experiments. There's sort of a, a feeling that the two most important things are just psychologically, we're reluctant to disappoint an authority figure, even if we're never going to see them again. And secondly, in confusing situations, we often look to authority figures for guidance on what to do. Now, you may find it a little bit of a stretch, but I actually think these ideas are relevant in recent goings on in the banks. I think a lot of people working in banks may have felt that what they were doing was not appropriate. We have all these stories from Washington Mutual, wasn't it, of giving sort of uh, $300,000 loans to mariachi singers or whatever else people were being asked to do. And, you know, there's a sense that that's not an appropriate thing to do. But 
people may have felt a psychological need to do what their bosses wanted, and their bosses wanted them to make these loans. It is important, as Milgram said, that you continue as we discussed. So people may have felt this psychological need to please the authority figure, and in confusing situations such as this one, you look to the authority figure, your boss, for guidance as to what to do, and if your boss says do it, you just do it. So it's not just a matter of getting concern about getting fired. I'm talking that in addition to that, these psychological considerations that Milgram is identifying. I think the last thing I'd mention on this particular section of the talk is diffusion of responsibility. Uh, another basic finding in psychology is that when there are many different parties that contribute to some flawed process, it's very easy for any one of them to blame the others and to absolve themselves of any responsibility and therefore to not take any corrective action. And one of the things that's very striking, if you remember the flow chart I showed you at the start of the talk, was how many different parties are involved in this process. You know, there's the borrower, there's the mortgage broker, the mortgage originator, the investment bank, the ratings agency, the end investor, and so on. And because there are so many parties involved, it's very easy for any one of them to say, look, I'm not doing anything wrong. If there is something wrong here, it's someone else that's contributing. And then you just keep on doing what you're doing. So what we just did is we talked a little bit about some of the problems with decision making within the banks. That was sort of the first part of the talk. The things I wanted to do just in the last part of the talk is pick out uh, some of the other puzzling things that have happened during this financial crisis and isolate some other psychological factors that we think might be relevant. In particular, I wanted to talk about the lack of trading in many debt markets. One really puzzling thing in the past few months is that there are certain markets where trading has almost completely dried up, and that's sort of a very, very rare occurrence in markets, and I want to mention two ideas, the idea of trust and ambiguity aversion related to that. Another big contributor to the housing bubble was this belief that many people had that house prices would just keep on rising for a long time. Where on earth did we get that idea? I want to mention two ideas of representativeness and overconfidence that might have contributed to that. And finally, the willingness of individuals to really take out excessive loans, larger loans than was really financially sane. And again, I want to mention two ideas, representativeness and optimism related to that. All right, so the first thing, the lack of trading in many markets, where might that come from? So I want to mention the idea of trust. We talk a lot about a credit crisis, and a lot of people have observed the, the root of the word credit, credere, to trust or to believe. So one idea that's, that's come up, uh, a lot of people have suggested, is that the lack of trading in some markets may be the result of a deterioration in the level of trust among market participants. So trust is an idea that you think we might be studying more in finance, but we actually haven't studied it as much as we should. But there are some recent studies which are quite intriguing. So there was one done recently on 2,000 households in the Netherlands, 2,000 Dutch households, and a remarkable finding uh, from this population is that less trusting households invested less in the stock market participated less in the stock market. Less trusting households, in a general sense, invested less in the stock market. And trust is measured through survey questions like this one. Generally speaking, would you say that most people can be trusted or that you have to be careful in dealing with people? That very general question, it turns out, predicts the level of investment in the stock market, your participation in the stock market. It's very striking to see trust come in like that. Not only does it predict levels of participation within a country, but it also helps explain something else very puzzling, which is why there are very different participation levels across countries. So, for instance, in Europe, one puzzling thing is why do people in some countries invest quite heavily in the stock market and people in other countries hardly at all? And this has been a long-standing puzzle, but recent studies suggest that trust plays an issue. So here's a picture showing you the cross-sectional relationship. You've got the level of trust in various countries along the horizontal, and how much the wealthy citizens participate in the stock market on the vertical. And you can see a clear positive relationship in countries where there's more trust, again measured through that survey question on the previous page, there's more participation in the stock market. So Sweden, which is the most trusting country uh, in Europe, uh, invests the most in the stock market. Greece, the least trusting country in Europe, invests uh, the least. 
So one idea that people have mentioned in the past year is that, you know, over the course of the past few months, there may have just been an evaporation of the notion of trust, and that may be really important for the willingness to participate in asset markets, perhaps helping us to understand why there's been so little trading in some markets. Another idea we think is important here is something that has a slightly fancy terminology, ambiguity aversion, but it's actually quite a simple idea. A uh, famous idea goes back to Daniel Ellsberg in the 1960s. It's this basic fact. People strongly dislike situations where they don't feel able to assign probabilities to outcomes ambiguity aversion. A very simple demonstration of this I can give you just in one slide uh, based on a couple of urns. I hope you all remember your urns from your statistics classes in undergraduate. So urn C is a certain urn, that's what the C stands for, and it has 100 balls in it and 50 of them are red and 50 of them are black. Then there's urn U, the uncertain urn, that's what the U stands for, also contains 100 balls, and some are red and some are black. They're all either red or black. You just don't know the proportion of each. So then we ask people to choose between the following two bets, R1 and R2. Here's the difference. With R1, I'm just going to draw a ball from the certain urn, and you'll get $20 if it's red. R2, I'm going to draw a ball from the uncertain urn, and you'll get $20 if it's red. And you can think a little bit about which of those two bets you would prefer. And then you ask another question, kind of related, which is choose between these two bets, B1 and B2. So B1, this time we're going to draw a ball from the certain urn. This time you'll get $20 if it's black. And then B2 is, let's draw a ball from the uncertain urn, and you'll get $20 if it's black. So what's interesting is people tend to choose R1 over R2 and B1 over B2. But that's considered a paradox, and you can probably see why, because it's not consistent with any beliefs you might have about the composition of the uncertain urn. Your willingness to take R1 over R2 means that you think that fewer than 50% of the balls in the uncertain urn are red, but will your willingness to choose B1 over B2 means that you believe that more than 50% of the balls in the uncertain urn are red. So there's a conflict there, and this is the Ellsberg paradox and often called ambiguity aversion. In other words, the explanation or what this phenomenon is labeled, it's labeled ambiguity aversion. We don't like ambiguity. We don't like situations where, as in the uncertain urn, we're not able to assign probabilities to outcomes. So you can see the application quite easily here. Given the news we've had in the last few months over the past year, uh, traders have become extremely nervous in the sense that they just don't feel able to assign probabilities to different outcomes. It's very hard to predict what's going to happen. It's very hard to know what level of defaults there are going to be. And since people are scared of that kind of ambiguity, they may just withdraw from the asset markets, perhaps again explaining the low level of trading in some markets. All right, uh, second thing I wanted to pull out was uh, turning to a slightly different, uh, different fact, which is uh, you know, this belief that a lot of people had that house prices would just keep on rising indefinitely, which we think was a major contributing factor to the bubble and to the excessive lending. Because people were saying, it's OK to lend this person some money, even if they don't have a good credit history, because in two years, the house will be worth more. They can just refinance and so on. It will all be fine. So everything was predicated on some notion that house prices would just keep on rising. Where on earth did that come from? So some, some psychology that it may be linked to is an idea of, called representativeness. It's a famous idea of Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. Uh, I can boil it down. It's sort of a complex idea, but I can boil it down very simply to say people have a tendency to see patterns in data that's actually completely random. And the pattern that people particularly love to see is a trend. People see trends in data that's actually completely random. And a famous example of this is the so-called hot hand phenomenon in basketball that a lot of you may be familiar with. So you have some basketball game. You have, you have two players who are roughly the same average ability. But in this particular game, one of them has made the last three shots. One of them has missed the last three shots. 
and you ask people, okay, which of the two players would you give the ball to at this moment? Overwhelmingly, people say the person who has made the last few shots because they feel that they've seen some kind of trend, some kind of hot streak that's going to be continued. So in the 1980s, some psychologists you know, were a bit puzzled about this. They decided to get the data and take a look. They got a long time series of data from a major basketball franchise. And what they found is there's no predictability at all in the data. It turns out that someone who's made the last three shots has a 0.46 chance of making the next one. Someone who's missed the last three shots has a 0.56 chance of making the next one. You're actually more likely to make it if you've missed the last three shots. So people are seeing a trend in the data where there isn't one. So that makes it a little bit easier to understand what happened here. House prices had been rising for a long time, for several years until recently. And if people do have a tendency to extrapolate trends too far into the future, then maybe that's where this belief came from, that house prices would just keep on rising. It was amplified by this representativeness tendency. I think another thing that was going on or contributing was so-called overconfidence, one of the most famous ideas in cognitive psychology, a very basic idea, which is that people strongly overestimate the precision of their forecast. So a very simple way this is demonstrated is you ask people to forecast something, whatever. It could just be a company's earnings next quarter or next year, but not just give you a point estimate, but also give you a confidence interval. Uh, for example, let's see, a 95% confidence interval so that you're 95% sure that the actual number will fall in that interval. And then later on, you can go and check how often does the actual number fall in that interval. And over sort of studies from many different domains, what you find is that the actual number falls in the interval only about 60% of the time. So people are giving a confidence interval that's way too narrow, suggesting that they're too confident about the precision of their forecast. So this, too, could have contributed to the poor modeling or the poor predictions we had about the future course of house prices. Because of overconfidence, we thought we could predict the future course of house prices better than we really could. We didn't take into account the possibility that there could be a national downturn in housing prices, perhaps again because of overconfidence in our estimates. And the last thing I wanted to mention was this, this thing that happened that lots of households took out loans that were just too large, that were not financially sensible. Why did that happen? Well, I think the representativeness, this extrapolation of past trends played a role in that. If you think that house prices are just going to keep on going up, then you probably will take out a loan that's larger than you should because you think, well, in two years the house will be worth more, I can just refinance and so on. But I think another aspect that's relevant is another famous phenomenon, which is simply labeled optimism. And it refers to the fact that people tend to have excessively rosy views of their future prospects. And this kind of thing is very si simple to establish. You just ask people uh, how likely they think certain setbacks are in their own case and in the case of, say, their college roommate or their neighbors, things like that. And people overwhelmingly think that setbacks are much more likely to happen to their roommate or their neighbor, much more likely to happen to those people than to me. Setbacks like whether it's getting a divorce, having a drinking problem, having a car accident, cancer, all these kinds of things. It's going to happen to other people. It's not going to happen to me. So you can see the application here once again. You, know, you might worry a little bit about the chance of default if you take out an excessively large loan, but then because of optimism you might say, oh, defaulting, that's just something that happens to other people, to my roommate, to my neighbor. It's not something that will happen to me. And then as a result, you take on too large a loan. All right, I think I've talked enough. I think I'd like to, to hear a little bit from from you as well, just to remind you of what we talked about, I sort of mentioned these two narratives that people have put forward in the financial press for what happened over the past year. The bad incentives narrative, the banks kind of knew what was going on, but their incentives just led them to continue doing what they were doing. The bad model view, which is that the incentives were fine, banks simply did, didn't have very good forecasts of what was going to happen in the future. And one thing I'm curious about is which, if any, 
of those two views you find more compelling. But what I wanted to do today was to suggest this alternative view today, more based on psychology and behavioral finance, which is that banks at some level may have been aware that there were problems with their business model, but as a result of a number of social psychological factors, uh, they deluded themselves effectively into thinking that everything was okay and ignoring warning signs. And we mentioned ideas like cognitive dissonance, conformity, groupthink, and obedience. And towards the end there, I wanted to pick out three other puzzling things and link those to certain pieces of psychology as well. The lack of trading in some debt markets, and I linked that to trust and ambiguity aversion. This belief we all had that house prices would keep on rising, and I linked that to representativeness and overconfidence, and the willingness of a lot of people to take out loans that were too large, and I linked that again to representativeness uh, and optimism. So let me stop there and just see if there are any questions, but not just questions, because I suspect that in this group uh, there's going to be a lot of informed viewpoints, and I'm actually very interested in hearing uh, what you think about recent events. Thank you very much. Okay. I've, taught, uh, I've taught this stuff for a long time. I love all this stuff. I think it's financially rewarding to understand this, but I had a couple little minor points. Mm -hmm. Since I teach finance students at a university much lower in the food chain than Yale, but these are the people who go out and do all these kinds of things, right, without a Yale education. Mm -hmm. And I teach them finance, and they can't do the most basic discounting. They can't do the most basic calculations in finance. So I think one of the things you left out is that you have to allow for ignorance and stupidity when... Uh, <laughs> I'm not, I'm serious about that. I love teaching, I love teaching these students, but the point is a lot of them just don't get it. And you, if you've been to a closing, I mean, you know what that stack of papers looks like, and you're signing forms that just say you understand that you signed a previous form, and, and, uh, and you write checks. You, you can't possibly, even if you're good, you might miss some stuff, but if you can't do any of the basic calculations or understand what an APR really is, then I think you have to allow for that as part of the problem, okay? And, and so, uh, then, Another simple solution you talked about, one thing that bothered me was the lack of trading. And you didn't mention Akerlof. You know, Akerlof did spend some time at Yale, didn't he, I think, in the past. And his Lemons model, I thought, is a really good explanation of that, where there's asymmetric information. The reason you don't trade is you think the person on the other side of the trade has more information than you do. And he showed, you know, that's why he won the Nobel Prize, that that's one of the reasons, right? And so I think that would be, that would be, a, nice, uh, uh, that would be a nice addition. And I think you could also add uh, the authority figures. When you're at the closing, you have authority figures telling you everything's all right. Uh, and I'm, I'm speaking from personal experience. I bought a house in San Diego in 2005. And so, <laughs> so well, I had to. It was her fault. <laughs> That's, no, she wasn't the authority figure. She's the reason I bought the house. <laughs> But in that room, right, and I was complaining that the, this is a bubble, and you know, I bought some insurance on one of those little tiny markets. I couldn't insure enough against it. But everybody in the room said, don't worry. In a year, the price of your house will be 20% higher. And so, and I, I knew that was a bunch of baloney, but anybody you know, normally would say, okay, these people are in the business. They all know about this. And so it's easy. So that would be an extra tie-in that the authority figures are telling these people that this is all fine, and so you should sign a loan. Don't worry about it. And so I think that would be, uh, that would be another addition. Mm -hmm. thank, 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 you, uh, thank you very much. I, I knew when I saw you, you'd be a good person to pick on for the first question. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, I, I actually do, do, agree with, with, with what you, do agree with what you say. The only thing I'd say is um, it, it may be too simple an explanation, the, the first element of sort of ignorance and so on for some of what happened. I think we just can't deny that some of the people at these banks that were doing a lot of this kind of work were well-trained, were smart, intelligent people from good universities. So it's a little bit tricky to sort of uh, say that what they were doing was the result of ignorance in, in, in all cases. Uh, I do agree that the situation is very complex, uh, sort of like a closing, as you said, is very complex. The question is, what do people do in complex situations? And I think that's where the psychology is helpful. It sort of gives us a, a framework of saying, in complex situations, what, what might people do? Um, I, I love your point about um, Akerlof uh, and his lemons. So uh, just a, a little bit of background there. This idea that this, this puzzle that there is that there's no trading in some debt markets, there's, there's two competing explanations. 
One is ambiguity aversion, as I told you, that we just don't know what the probability distribution of the outcomes is. That scares us as human beings, so we all back off. Another more sort of classic explanation is this sort of Lemons idea, which is asymmetric information. One of the parties knows less than another, and therefore you don't want to trade because you're worried that you're going to trade and be disadvantaged in the trade because the other person is more informed. And actually, there's been quite a lot of active debate about which of those two views is right. But I, I have had a sense that people are inclining more to the ambiguity aversion view because they really think that everyone in the market is confused. And, and there's very little, there's not one party that really has a very good understanding of how these, uh, of the future, of the probability distribution of future cash flows. Everyone is confused, and that's why we're inclining a little bit more to the ambiguity aversion uh, idea. But I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah, so the question is about the fact that there was sort of government mandating of a lot of the expansion of lending, particularly to the more disadvantaged members of society. And, and I agree, there was definitely such a push. Uh, and I think what may have happened is, uh, you, you, I think you, you put it well, I think that a lot of banks may have used that as a rationalization. Uh, what we're doing is not a bad thing. This is what the government wanted all along. We're giving loans to people who really need them. This is a good thing that we're doing. Whereas really, if they thought more carefully, I think they'd figured out that they had gone too far. Of course, there should be some expansion of lending, make sure these lending opportunities are available to everyone, but there is such a thing as going too far. And I think we went way over the line. Um, I've been selling uh, real estate for 45 years. I own a little real estate company overlooking Harvard Square. People make a complex situation out of what is really a very simple choice. Uh, you want to live somewhere, you've chosen your community. You have not one option, but two. You can rent or you can buy. And uh, for years, I've been urging people, just compare the costs of the two. You know what the rent is. You find uh, two houses that you like about equally. Compare the monthly total of the mortgage costs, 30-year fixed rate mortgage. If you want, you can deduct the tax benefits that your accountant tells you. And compare uh, the mortgage and taxes versus the rent. If they're about the same, you can buy with confidence because even if the market drops, you can rent it out and cover your costs, you're hedged. By the way, I wrote that and Barron's published it in July 2005. <laughs> um, that sounds like sage advice. And one thing that my colleague Bob Schiller is very keen on is just more, more financial education, more, more accessible financial education to more people uh, so that we can make more informed decisions about things like, like buying houses, yeah. But I, I did not hear you um, uh, refer at all to the uh, political leadership, which was uh, largely touting a, a millennialist uh, approach to uh, a new economy such as we had never seen, um, that the old rules no longer applied, that uh, a, a total what seemed to me as an interest, uh, interested person in history, lack of historical perspective um, that was widely sold to the, to the population and, and uh, certainly seemed to me to be feeding into the sense of optimism. Uh, the leaders were not advocating caution and the sage advice of the realtor that we just heard from. Um, the best and the brightest uh, apparently weren't as smart as all of them thought they were either and there was as a result of 9-11, also a kind of demonization of, of dissent on many fronts where people were charged with not supporting the economy, giving aid and comfort to the enemy, and uh, many factors that fed into the lack of desire to rock the boat by strongly representing other opinions. So, and the last point is uh, a sense of individualism that everybody by themselves is going to save themselves and to hell with the polity and social compassion uh, a total lack of social concern, greed is good, and the individual engine of greed is going to make this market serve everyone, and I think we've put paid to that now. I'm interested in your thoughts. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, you're, you're, sort of giving, you're, you're sort of giving voice to, to a certain 
to a certain narrative, and I suspect there's a lot of truth in what you say. But let me, let me, let me, let me mention that there is a more benign view of all this that be, before we sort of completely rush to judgment, which is the bad models narrative that I mentioned, that I think has a lot of truth to it, which is it's not that these banks are full of bad people or evil people or anything like that. Um, the models they were using to forecast the future were just not very good. They didn't take into account the fact that there could be a national downturn in housing prices. And now it's very easy to say, oh, those models should have been better. How foolish they were to not have better models. But at the time, it was not so obvious. To really understand that there could be a large decline in real estate prices, you had to anticipate a number of amplification mechanisms that we understand now, but may have been a little bit tricky to, to forecast at the time. For instance, the amplification mechanism whereby, you know, when a house forecloses, it's often vacant, that drags down the price of other houses in the neighborhood, which then impels them to foreclose, and there's a spiral that occurs there. Now we understand that, but it may not have been that easy to forecast uh, at the time. Another piece of evidence I'll give you for the bad models view is that if it was so obvious that everything was so messed up and that we were heading towards disaster, you would have seen a large number of hedge funds make a lot of money by just betting on the fact that a lot of these securities would plunge in value. Very few hedge funds made a lot of money. We hear about John Paulson making a lot of money. He's the only one. It was, even these very smart hedge fund managers were not able to foresee <coughs> this disaster. So there is a, a more benign narrative that I do want to emphasize, which is that it was just hard to foresee a lot of this. Ex post, it's easy to criticize. And I do think there's some criticism that should go around, but I, I, want, I, I, I do want to put the benign narrative on the table as well. Practically, practically everyone in this room can, as soon as the meeting is over, go on the phone and go either long or short one or another of these securities. And I suspect none of us will do so either long or short. Uh, and I think what we have is, uh, in the current situation, is a tremendous lack of conviction among thoughtful people as to what the future holds. Even such fundamental questions as to whether inflation or deflation is more likely are not clear. Uh, you can argue them, but I don't know too many people who are confident of their, of, and if in the absence of confidence, uh, people are reluctant to take positions, uh, uh, not because the guy on the other side of the trade is smarter than you are, because whichever half of us would want to go long isn't actually any better informed than whichever half of us would want to go short, so none of us do anything. Yeah. Um, as you're speaking a little bit to the, 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 to the question that came up earlier, which is, is this, is this uh, passive behavior we're all exhibiting, is it really an asymmetric information issue that we're just scared the person on the other side knows a lot, or that none of us really knows anything, uh, we're just very hard to predict the future and therefore we just don't do anything. And you seem to be embracing a little bit the latter view, and, and I completely agree with that. I, I definitely believe and, and see the psychological forces that are at play in the, in the current economic recession. I'm curious more now, we're talking a lot about regulation to prevent this from happening again. And I'm curious if it's something that is so psychological, maybe not to completely explain the crisis, but if it's such sort of innate behavior, how do we regulate it? And, mm -hmm. and how do we do something to prevent it from happening mm -hmm. again? Yeah. Um, so uh, we're reading a lot about regulation in the financial press, uh, more regulation of derivatives and so on, and I think some regulation on those dimensions is certainly a good idea. But let me speak a little bit more to your question, which is what kind of, I, what kind of action should we take if you embrace the psychology-based approach here? Um, so, so I think the main thing I would say uh, is that perhaps organization should be structured in ways that lead to better decision making. In other words, be aware of these various things, be aware of conformity, uh, be aware of groupthink, and try to structure the decision making within the firm in a way that leads to better decisions. Uh, make sure that when a major decision is being made, that many divergent views are heard. Make sure that there isn't a leader who sort of announces the view that he wants to reach at the start, and then everyone else just follows along. Try and avoid those preconditions for groupthink. I mean, one very basic idea that has emerged over the past three decades in psychology is that behavior is not so much a function of people's personality, it's a function more of their environment. Uh, and therefore, we can really alter people's behavior by altering the environment, by structuring an environment 
that leads to better decision making. So I'm, I'm hoping that uh, the social psychologists will work more on that, on thinking about organizational structures that lead to better decision. Um, you've looked at the psychological dimensions of a problem that I might suggest is inherently structural. In your original slide, we looked, for instance, at credit rating. Now, instead of looking at the top of the tree, let's look down the tree. Credit rating failed for the same reason I would contend the system is now paralyzed, which is conflict of interest. And if we see that as a structural issue, we can look at your authority figure models and the like and deduce some solutions which we have yet to implement, specifically, for instance, underlying the fiduciary assumption of public equity markets. We could separate the role of CEO and board chair as a matter of law. The Dick Grasso excess spoke to it, and yet to this day, nobody has attacked the structural issue of conflict of interest, which might restore trust to the market. Do you see a psychological explanation or a political explanation to the failure to solve that problem? Yes, so you're, you're rightly bringing our attention to the conflicts of interests at the ratings agencies. And, and there is no doubt, um, there's no doubt that that is a big problem, and I would like to, to see a change there. And it probably took, or will take, a crisis like the one we've just been through to really force a change. I just wanted to suggest that there's other things going on, because to even bring those mortgage-backed security CDOs to the ratings agencies to rate, someone had to make those loans in the first place. Uh, the local loan originators had to make the loans, the borrowers had to accept them, uh, they had to get sold to investment banks who were willing to package them. There were so many other components of this, and I'm just trying to suggest that there were psychological factors that greased that process. But I'm glad you brought up what you did, because there's clearly major problems with the ratings agencies, and we need to address those as well. Yes. Thank you for calling on me. I'm Bronwyn Bateman, and I went to UC Berkeley at a time when Yale did not admit women. And I also chaired the Conflict of Interest Committee for the entire UCLA campus. But my comment is really a psychological one, and it has to do with predatory loaning. And the people at high levels who were very well educated, understood economics, incentivized people at the bottom of the pyramid to sell loans. And I, I represent Nicaragua in the state of Colorado, and there are so many Hispanics who take out these loans, not very well educated, it's done in Spanish, but the people at the bottom of the pyramid are incentivized. So the people at the top incentivize the people at the bottom, and it was very predatory. You know, when you're educated and you do something stupid, you say, gosh, I made a mistake. But the people at the bottom were just taken advantage of, and then those loans were packaged and all kinds of problems mm -hmm. ensued. But the fundamental problem was incentivizing people at the bottom of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so you, you, it sounds like you're, you're, you're quite convinced about what we call the bad incentives view at the start. And I think that's definitely, uh, many people have that view. I, and I think it is a, a reasonable one. Again, just to put side by side the more benign narrative, a, a lot of people think that actually the, the innovation of subprime lending was actually a very good innovation, a, a smart innovation that allowed people uh, at the sort of lower socioeconomic end to, to borrow and own their own home. Uh, the idea was that you could give these people a loan and then the value of their house would go up and then they could refinance and it would all kind of work out. It was actually viewed as a clever piece of financial innovation. And to some extent, it is a clever piece of financial innovation. I just think we went too far with it. So there, there is a more benign narrative. I don't want to suggest that everything here is rotten at the core. Uh, but I certainly, your point is well taken, and I agree with the direction you're going. Well, well because your analysis suggests that these problems uh, derive from our basic psychology, it looks like we're fated to always repeat these cycles, uh, kind of a feedback loop into a mass hysteria that will bite us you know, and possibly more quickly as the uh, speed of uh, transactions increases. Is there a way to just put a break on the excess uh, 
rather than try to, in fact, think our way out of it, just to prevent these cycles from spinning so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, Sure, more preventive measures. Well, I, I, going back to the issue of regulation, I do think that we're going to see a, a no, uh, quite a lot of regulation in force, and some of that I think will be very sensible. I, I just wanted to come back to one thing you said, which is that you know because these are psychological factors, we're sort of fated to always repeat these mistakes. I, I did want to mention again that this very interesting trend in psychology in the past 30 years, beginning with the work of Michelle at Columbia in the late 60s, which is that we always thought that people's behavior was based on their personality. If they had a particular kind of personality, they were always going to act a particular way. But what we've really learned is that the environment matters a huge amount. You can take the same person and put them in very different environments, and they'll act in completely different ways. And that's why I feel more hopeful that if I can get the social psychologist to think harder about organizational behavior, ways of getting better decisions out of organizations, then I think, I think there is hope. Uh, I'd like to see more of that kind of work. One problem is that you really become famous in psychology by finding a bias by finding an error, a cognitive error that people make. That what, that's what makes you famous in psychology. You don't really become famous by figuring out how to correct that error. Uh, <laughs> so again, you become famous for, you become famous for, biasi, for biases, finding a bias, not for de-biasing. And I think there should be much more emphasis uh, in that work on de-biasing. Maybe just take a couple more questions and then let you get on with your day. Um, uh, sir, yes, please. Uh, I, have a question about, I have a question about the role in, in all this of, the, by the, of these insurance policies called credit default swaps. Uh, forget the, that piece of jargon there, insurance policies. So many, so many people who invested at the investment end, down, down at the bottom of your, who uh, bought these bonds and securities, also were told by the financial advisors, whatever, buy a hedge, hedge what you're doing by buying a, some insurance. And the people doing it knew that this was not regulated, that the people selling, whether it was a guy from Bear Stearns or a guy from uh, Lehman Brothers or AIG selling you this swap, uh, did, not have, did not have mandated reserves to back up the insurance. You knew nothing. There was a complete asymmetry of information. Uh, and, and it seems to me in this situation, I don't know if you agree, that the, the, in this situation the asymmetry encouraged the people to buy the bond and, because, and, buy, the, and buy the insurance, buy the swap, to back it up with more confidence because they expected that the guy from Bear Stearns, if he's willing to sell me this insurance on this bond, He's got a lot more information than I do. I don't know any, you know, he's willing to, he must be confident that this bond is good. Otherwise, he wouldn't sell me the insurance policy. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you think that kind of uh, sort of backup confidence in all of these financial instruments that were sold in such huge numbers mm -hmm. was a factor uh, because this is a situation where asymmetry encourages to, to go ahead, not, mm -hmm. not to hang back. Mm -hmm. Not to not make the trade, it encourages you to make the trade. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, that's an interesting idea, a asymmetry actually leading to, to more trade rather than less. I mean, I, I think the crucial error there is people not thinking about whether the credit default swap contract could actually be fulfilled in event of adverse circumstances. Uh, and that, I, I again pull back to the bad model problem. People really didn't have models that forecast the kind of bad scenarios we've been through. Um, and I honestly think it, it, was, it, was, it was genuinely hard at the time to forecast this scenario, and a lot of smart people failed to do so. Your question, or the question seemed to follow the fault line you started with between rationalism and emotional decision making. Um, everyone wanting to ascribe either the ability to correct things because they're systemic and we can tinker with them, or perhaps, no, it's just innate. Um, I, w I don't know, do you recommend that your students read the uh, it was extraordinary popular delusions and the madness of crowds, which I think I was recommended 40 years ago. There is a periodicity. These things happen over and over and over and over again. So do you think that that is a lack of information and if you merely tell the people who are acting emotionally that they're misinterpreting the odds, that they will become a different kind of decision maker and socially, do you think that it's possible to become more rational collectively. Mm -hmm. um, so the issue of sort of correcting some of these biases. So 
what I would say is, um, a number of questioners have sort of said, I think to some extent rightly, that a lot of these psychological factors really are deep in the human psyche. And so, yes, it's not possible to just sort of snap our fingers and suddenly start to think rationally. Uh, we have all these heuristics and so on that may have been evolutionarily very useful. They're just not very useful today I in today's markets. There is research on whether people can correct their biases, on whether they can learn their way out. And definitely, uh, looking at evidence can help, uh, understanding your error can help you to learn your way out of biases, but it's not completely successful. And, and that's why I think, again, sort of organizing, uh, uh, creating organizations which lead to the best possible decision making by having many different points of view so that each individual error can cancel out, uh, I, I think is maybe the most useful direction. And I hope that, you know, if you come back in five years, we'll have more research to tell you about that. Thank you. Thank you.